I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, you're back. Yes, thank you. So, uh, Ahmed, uh, please uh, let us know when we can start. Ahmed Mohsen. Shall we start? Yeah, sure. In one minute, and we'll start. One minute. Okay. One minute. Yeah. So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Um, I am Ahmed Mohsen. I work as an Associate Energy Officer at the ENOC Group Sustainability Office. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to the live webinar on the role of government and industry in the Green Mobility Agenda. Conducted as part of ENOC Energy Award Week by ENOC Group Sustainability Office under the support of the Clean Energy Business Council. I will now leave the floor for Mr. Ahmad Samir from the Clean Energy Business Council to give an introduction and start our session today. Then after that, I will be joining you again to take you on uh, activity, our activity post the webinar, inshallah. Wish you all the best. Enjoy. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, if you go to the next slide, Zulfir. So uh, thanks again for everyone who's joining the webinar today. This is um, um, a partnership between Enid Group and the Clean Energy Business Council. Just uh, a very quick introduction about CEBC for those who uh, are not aware. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide as well, Zulfa. So CEBC is a not-for-profit membership organization based out of the UAE, and we cover the whole uh, Middle East and North Africa region. So the role that CBC plays is basically to represent the private sector in the clean energy uh, industry uh, and act as a voice to, uh, with the public uh, sector. Uh, we try to establish a, a dialogue between uh, both sectors and drive the needed regulations and policies in different topics that we work on that I mentioned in the next few slides. If you go to the next slide, Zulfa. So what we do at CBC is uh, we, as I mentioned, we will present the private sector to, we, we do a lot of stakeholders meetings with the different government stakeholders uh, to address the challenges that our members are facing. Uh, we uh, build a lot of partnerships between the government stakeholders and our members, between our members and each other, and also with international organizations. At CBC, we organize a lot of events, uh, publish a lot of reports, case studies, or, uh, policy papers, white papers, etc. And for those who haven't heard about us and are interested to check our reports and publications, if you go to the CBC website, uh, you'll find the link at the end. Just go to Knowledge Center and I think you'll find a lot of reports, including electric mobility, about this. Um, it's, uh, it's very highly recommended. Some publications are very new, so uh, it's, uh, it should be interesting to look at this section. If you can go to the next slide and the one after uh, Zulfa. Can you skip that? Yeah, go to the next one. So at CBC, we, uh, we work on different working groups. So each working group is almost a separate entity within the organization. So we have three main topics that we cover uh, for 2020, and this are going to be expanded in 2021. So currently we are focusing on sustainable finance, uh, mainly green bonds, green schools, uh, carbon taxation, carbon uh, pricing. These are very interesting topics, and the region has a very um, high potential in these specific topics. Uh, energy efficiency, we have here uh, Mr. Rush and Mr. Faisal as well. He knows how uh, how big is the potential for energy efficiency in the region as a whole. So we work on two different streams, uh, building good fitting as well as industrial energy efficiency. We have a lot of members uh, our certified ESCOs, uh, energy service companies, and uh, companies working in the industrial energy efficiency sector as well. 
The third working group is Future Mobility Club, and this was uh, used to be called Elect uh, New Energy Vehicles Club, but due to the interest from some companies who are not uh, directly in the uh, e-mobility sector, so we decided to uh, uh, change the name to be Future Mobility Club. Right now, our focus is in the e-mobility sector and the UAE, focusing mainly in the infrastructure, and that's one of the reasons why we are um, co-organizing this group now with any today, group today. Um, so that we have two programs, uh, mainly covering women in clean energy, which is very active now. We recently launched a mentorship program for women, young, uh, young uh, professionals, uh, connecting them with uh, experts from all over the world to get one-to-one, one-year mentorship. Uh, we, have, we do a lot of webinars and uh, published a, a report recently on the gender equality in the clean energy sector. This also you can find on the Knowledge uh, Knowledge Center. The second program we have is a schools program. So before COVID, we used to organize a lot of field trips for school students, uh, send um, our members to organize seminars, etc. But unfortunately, now this uh, one is uh, inactive due to the COVID-19 restrictions. If you go to the next slide, Zulfa. So our members, uh, Enoch is one of the key members we have at CBC. Uh, we have almost 122 members covering very different and diverse sectors, as you can see from this slide. Um, this also you can find the CBC, CBC website uh, if you're interested to hear more, but as Enoch uh, staff, you are by default a member of the CBC because it's company membership. Um, so if, if you're not aware that you are a member, so please uh, make sure that you go to the CBC website, subscribe to our newsletter so that you can get notifications of our emails, uh, events, publications, etc. If you go to the next slide, Zofa. We also have uh, many partnerships uh, to make sure that we enlarge the benefits that our members could get. Uh, we have uh, partnerships with the key organization from, organizations from all over the world, as you can see from this slide. Uh, next slide. I'll talk a little bit very quickly about the Future Mobility Club. When we started this, the main mission was to support the transition of the automotive industry in the UAE as a first case study and the MENA region potentially, uh, starting hopefully from next year towards being a green and smart uh, sector. And we have two subgroups, if uh, you go to the next slide. We divide that into two uh, workforces. Uh, these are our members. First, Jan, yeah, the members of the working group. And if you go to the next slide as well. So we have two uh, subgroups under the Future Mobility Club. Uh, one is focusing mainly on the infrastructure and the regulations, and this is the most important one. Uh, it's as important as the second one, but there's a lot of work, I think, uh, still needs to be done on that one. Uh, there, there's different objectives that we need to achieve within the coming few months, including supporting uh, the, to draft uh, some of the game mobility policies and mandates uh, in the UAE, not just Dubai. So hopefully we'll be working with uh, the Supreme Council and all, and all the other uh, policymakers to try to address the points of our members, increase the market reach, and try to find incentives to the manufacturers to build their EV models. One of the challenges that we are uh, seeing is that the customer doesn't have a, a lot of choices. So hopefully if we have more choices for the customers uh, through incentivizing the manufacturers to bring their EV models, that uh, would have a positive impact on the EV market in the UAE. Uh, we work on supporting uh, the build-up of the new infrastructure. I think one of the key areas here is awareness for the building owners and the developers also on uh, what it takes to, do, to install the charging stations and what are the long-term uh, benefits for them. Uh, creating um, uh, So we have some insurance firms, if you have noticed from the slide uh, before, we are interested also to look at the insurance of the vehicle and the infrastructure as well. So this is a very important point we are also looking at. The last point is creating incentives and uh, from banks as well and some uh, financial packages. So we have some banks. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the focus of the banks right now. So most of them are still in an exploration phase. But this is an interesting point to look at uh, even on long term. 
market awareness is our second subgroup and uh, there's a lot of work also needs to be done because most of the people are not aware of what what's the status of the EV market in the EU right now. There's a lot of charging stations and people are not aware of them. There's a lot of EV models available and they are not aware of them. So uh, making sure that the market is also aware of how uh, developed the market is, is very important. Um, and there's a lot of activities that could be done and needs to be done on this, under this uh, school. Um, if you go to the next slide. So this is uh, very briefly what I have uh, for today about the Future Mobility Club. And if you have any questions uh, specifically on the FMC, uh, CEBC, what you as an ENIC staff employee can benefit from the membership, please reach out to me on this email and be happy to discuss with you. So now I'll hand it over to uh, Mr. Fazil Abdurrahman from uh, EY uh, to introduce the webinar and uh, take the discussion forward. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of uh, the webinar hosted by Clean Energy Business Council and ENOC. In fact, it's a very interesting topic. It's a topic which touches across uh, various stakeholders, be it the government agenda, be it the industry agenda, or be it the consumer agenda. And even in the industry, it's a, it's a topic which cuts across several sectors. It cuts across the oil and gas sector, the automotive sector, the utility sector, the service industry, and whatnot. And uh, we are at the right time to discuss such a topic. And uh, we are delighted to have a diverse uh, panel members for this discussion. Now, to set the scene for the day, we will have 15 minutes presentation by each of our three panelists. And uh, after this, we are happy to take the questions from the audience. And uh, Many thanks to all the audience who are joined in. Uh, we can see close to 60 members who are already in, and that, that number is increasing every minute by minute. So it's, it's good to have such a good number of audience, and uh, I'm sure uh, you will be uh, having an interesting discussion going ahead. Uh, without further delay, let me introduce you to our first speaker, Mr. Faisal Ali Rashid. We are happy to have him on the board. Mr. Faisal is the senior director at Dubai Supreme Council of Energy, and he looks after the Wall Energy Demand Site Management Program. And in fact, he is spearheading the Wall program, and he has been uh, been there right from the inception of the program. It's a program which has been making a lot of good waves around the region, and we are happy to have Faisal on the board. Prior to joining Supreme Council of Energy, Faisal has been in the oil and gas industry for 15 years in various roles, uh, managing uh, the project division, the project manager, and handling the mega projects in particular. Faisal has educational background. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineer from the Dayton Ohio University in US. He's also a certified project management professional. He has an LSE professional certificate in the area of energy public policy making. So no better person to start off our session uh, than Mr. Faisal Rashid. Thanks a lot, Faisal. Over to you. F Faisal, if I may, I think you are on mute. If you can unmute yourself, I think we'll be able to hear you. Thank you. Is it okay now? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel, for the kind introduction. Um, very pleased, I think, to join all of you and to join uh, particularly this panel. So I'll speak today about the uh, uh, electrification uh, of vehicle and green mobility uh, initiative uh, in Dubai and how it is associated with our strategic uh, approach uh, in Dubai and it comes under our broader vision which is uh, Clean Energy Strategy 2050 and Dubai Integrated Energy Strategy 2030 and also DSM Strategy 2030. 
green mobility is part of uh, the whole thing, so we, we are very much uh, uh, into the uh, uh, the roadmap uh, aspect and to the target uh, also aspect and to the implementation as well and to the governance uh, structure that we already have also to basically make this uh, successful uh, journey. Uh, next. And uh, what's uh, triggering uh, the green mobility aspect and uh, sustainability of green mobility, I think, uh, uh, is mainly the, uh, the air pollution, uh, as you can see in this slide. Uh, the main contributor to the air to the air to the air pollution is the transport and industries, which is small in Dubai, and also energy generation, which basically provide uh, power uh, energy. I mean, uh, power and water to all the building assets in Dubai. Uh, uh, on top of that, also if we break down the transportation emission in Dubai, uh, which you are familiar with. Uh, we can see that the share of uh, land transport is around uh, 45% uh, or so. So this is uh, uh, what we basically uh, uh, drive us also to improve uh, uh, the uh, aspect of mobility and to uh, look into the air quality as well and, uh, and ensure that the emission will uh, go down in the, on the horizon 2025 and 2030 and beyond. Next. Uh, as the uh, as we can see that uh, the uh, the main objective of the uh, green uh, mobility transport uh, strategy we uh, see it uh, as uh, uh, an opportunity it offers uh, Good economic benefit, environmental benefit as well in terms of in terms of reducing the carbon emission. It offers deep uh, cut to uh, uh, deep cut to petroleum product as well. And uh, before basically uh, thinking of driving this uh, into the coming years, we looked at everything uh, and we have looked at uh, some key question. What are the effective strategy that uh, we need to consider, which we already have today? What are the initiatives that can be converted to policy, to regulation, and also to uh, uh, capital uh, project? Uh, also, we looked at the tipping point. When would be the tipping point or the prosperity? Could be maybe five years away from today, so we have to be ready. What would be the initial capital investment also that we need to put uh, at the beginning, especially with the charging infrastructure, uh, which will be put by uh, government, I'll, I'll talk about it later on. Uh, and of, of course, the total cost uh, or the business case, the economic business case that we have to understand well, that uh, everything has to make sense uh, economically and financially. Uh, this is the key driver to us, especially in Dubai. We uh, try to always uh, convert the environmental benefit to also economic benefit uh, in the meantime. So within this uh, talk, I'll concentrate more on the electric vehicle and hybrid. We have many, um, there are many uh, initiatives in Dubai uh, beside uh, hybrid and electric uh, as, as basically, as you can see in my slide, uh, and they are moving and some of them are headed by different stakeholders as well, and some of them are linked to federal gover government as well, that uh, they also have to uh, put ground in order to make, make them happen, happening. Uh, next. Also, we looked at the, uh, we're looking at the increased uh, sale of uh, hybrid and EV across uh, the world and I mean there are uh, the barriers basically to own EV or hybrid today almost are not there uh, whether technical barrier because we know that there are models available especially hybrid uh, type and even financial like you can see that the total cost of ownership for hybrid is almost uh, uh, close to the conventional cars and for EV it's not far away 
Um, we have looked at uh, the best practices as well. We looked at the, uh, the leading uh, countries who basically committed themselves to, to uh, go strong on the uh, EV, especially uh, in the coming years. We, we see that Norway and China are leading uh, the world. Nor Norway is uh, uh, an example of a small country and China, of course, is huge. Uh, they have a huge market uh, in China. Uh, there are 450 EV buses, 450,000 EV buses in China today as they lead the market of EV. Um, they have limited the use of uh, four-wheeler in many cities and uh, limited or restricted in many cities in China. And for Norway, as you can see, that five years from today, they are banning the use of uh, purchase, purchase of uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, vehicle and their share today of uh, EV and hybrid uh, is exceeding 40% out of the overall uh, sales. So this is uh, very promising. And there are other countries as well in the C40 uh, the group, uh, which contains more than 100 cities. They committed to purchase only EV buses beyond 2025. Uh, next. And of course, uh, this is a key slide when we uh, uh, we, we look at uh, the cost of, especially the cost of EV, we look at the total uh, ownership cost on the horizon of, let's say, five years from today or 10 years. And uh, uh, for hybrid, it's already there. For, for EV, it's not far away. The cost parity, which could happen maybe in 2025 or close to 2025, I think we don't want to wait. Uh, we want to start by basically building the uh, uh, infrastructure so we slowly go toward uh, the basically uh, transition of our energy which is uh, not only uh, EV and uh, green mobility but it's a bigger aspect but for this I think we need uh, don't want to have a disruption of the economy even for the fossil fuel we ensure that uh, a smooth transition will happen uh, gradual uh, build up of the infrastructure which is already there in Dubai in terms of uh, charging point we want to have also a gradual uh, basically uh, transition with the uh, car manufacturer and uh, uh, car dealers also whom are responsible also to bring uh, uh, EV and hybrid vehicle in Dubai I think there's there's in the Dubai and UAE which is still limited today we look forward to also that as well. And this is, I think, how we can have undisrupted, uh, I think, uh, uh, journey uh, where it will not basically, we don't have to move to, toward, uh, let's say, EV and hybrid in one or two years. We want to have a slow and a gradual move that does, does not disturb the economy. Next. And of course, uh, our journey has already started in 2015. It's a long journey and uh, nothing, I think, better than basically uh, lead, I mean, having the governing by example to, for the government to lead the market development in Dubai. Uh, so we looked at the government fleet at that uh, point in 2015, the total fleet uh, of government around 30,000 government of Dubai and uh, we have uh, basically issued uh, a directive basically mandating uh, all government entities in Dubai to consider uh, buying uh, EV or hybrid, 10% uh, uh, EV or hybrid within the total annual uh, sale and uh, the, the target at that time to reach 10% uh, uh, basically share out of uh, total fleet uh, in 2020 uh, by then and I'll talk a little bit more about you know the number that we have reached uh, since 2015 and how we move toward that uh, we have uh, this is for the government fleet of course as I said that it will prepare the market it will develop the market slowly it will also encourage the, the, the car uh, deal also to bring more uh, uh, vehicle and we, we always uh, uh, basically hear that new models are coming in 2020 or 2021 so we're excited also to see more 
On top of that, of course, we have to look at the Dubai fleet uh, as a whole, which we basically uh, targeting the uh, private uh, car owner. And uh, we have a target of 10% penetration by 2030. And for the private car owner, of course, uh, uh, it's not about mandate. Uh, it's about incentive. It's about uh, uh, awareness. It's, a, it's about making them understand the total uh, cost of ownership, uh, uh, which uh, something I think we have to do more and more, more education and awareness uh, aspects. So everybody uh, in, in the city and the Emirates and the UAE understand the benefit of uh, not only the environmental benefit, also the economic benefits. So we look forward to see uh, the uh, uh, movement toward that. Uh, next. And uh, this is uh, basically some figure I'm, I'm just sharing with you. Uh, the, uh, the When we started uh, the, the strategy in 2015, the total number of hybrid and EV uh, breaking down already in my slide uh, was 435 uh, total. And as we move from 2015 to 16 and 17 up to 20, uh, after 2019, we have reached uh, close to 7,000, as, as, as I speak, uh, 7,000 total, including uh, around 5,500 hybrid and uh, around 1,200 1, uh, uh, EV. And for the uh, government fleet, uh, which basically uh, we're monitoring basically the penetration, we're monitoring the total uh, share of uh, EV and hybrid uh, so when we started, the, the EV and uh, hybrid share used to be 1.4% in 2015. And as we move forward, we have uh, increased the share to 3.3 .3 in 2016 and 5.5 in 2017. And now um, we are close to 8%, which basically close to our target of 10% by end of uh, 2020. So I think uh, in Dubai, we be basically uh, believe in uh, measurement and verification. We believe in follow up. We believe in government structure, which we already have a committee, a steering and technical committee to basically work with the government and uh, collect the data and communicate with the government uh, entities uh, to ensure that we are reaching our goal and the market will slowly develop uh, uh, and the horizon 2025 and further. Next. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, when we uh, work uh, on this uh, uh, topic, uh, which we all have a passion for, we need to align with all, I think, uh, uh, with all sides, including uh, all government, as I have uh, mentioned, that the uh, government needs to, so, to lead by examples to help uh, uh, develop the market, to uh, basically set up a target and roadmap and uh, uh, put up uh, regulation as well and incentive uh, uh, to the private owners as well. Uh, we work also with the dealers to ensure that uh, models will, will come they, they, they all have strategy in the horizon 2025 and 2030 uh, in terms of uh, what uh, how, how many new models are coming in, the, in these uh, uh, within the coming year period uh, of course uh, banks as well uh, offering uh, for them to uh, they have responsibility to offer attractive uh, financial option uh, to the uh, recipient and of course, the federal uh, government as well, uh, they have a role as well, and we need to work with them to ensure that uh, we not only cover Dubai, we cover, I think, the whole Emirates in terms of the uh, charging uh, point, in terms of policies as well, in terms of uh, uh, having EV standards and having uh, hybrid standards as well. So in, in the, today, Dubai is leading, uh, I think, the region in terms of number of charging points. Uh, some are on, mostly owned by the government and some are owned by private. We have more than 350 total uh, charging points in Dubai. Uh, I think there are many also 
private uh, charging point to basically uh, uh, used by many private uh, car owner. Uh, but I think the, the limitation is people who live in building or condos, they, they, cannot, you know, they cannot have basically, there's no provision for them to have a private uh, charging point. That's, that's why I think the public charging point would support this uh, uh, aspect. Uh, I think this is my last slide. I can maybe later on take some question. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. That was very informative. It's, it's good to know uh, the initiatives from the government and, and the way forward which is being planned. And also great to see some of the stats out there. I think that was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. So, so our next speaker for the session is Mr. Mark Carson. Mark is Director of Customer Experience and Quality for Eno Middle East, uh, covering 14 countries for the MENA and the Levant region. And he has been based in the Dubai office for the past eight years. As, as a Customer Experience and Quality Director, Mark is responsible for the sale and service customer experience in each country, along with the product quality. Uh, he successfully completed his automotive and engineering degree and he joined Renault UK and carried out a number of roles throughout the business, be it from training, technical and customer satisfaction departments and so on. Before moving to the Middle East, he was responsible for the network field quality and government liaison and was actively involved in the introduction of Renault's EV program in the UK market. I, I invite Mark to the session. Mark, over to you. Glad to have you for the discussion. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and share some of uh, uh, some information with everyone today really more about our electric vehicle strategy and probably to give an insight more in line with the theme of, of global mobility and where we're looking to go forward as we, as we come so some of the slides probably will be uh, representative of what engineer Faisal just showed us so uh, my first slide obviously is really is where we are today. Um, um, we see ourselves in a different world um, for many reasons, ones that we didn't expect I think this year that we are all aware of. Um, but we're now starting to see governments becoming more and more sensitive to the economical and the environmental issues that are posed um, from pollution. Um, EVs, Renault launched back into EV, took the decision in 2007 to start on the, the EV path. Um, and at that time, we decided it was a, a full EV path. Today, obviously, we, we are introducing hybrids as well because there is a need for hybrids globally. Um, it was seen in 2007 that maybe the development of EV would be more quicker than it actually has been. But I would say over the last five years, we start to see the adoption in a lot of countries, more so from what the government has proposed and the government regulations have introduced. So we see more and more government uh, fleets uh, become more sensitive, uh, implementing CO2 limits in their policies with more EVs. Um, and we see what we're seeing now is in a lot of countries is low emission areas and public regulations are expanding, which is slightly different from banning internal combustion engine totally, because I think every government knows it's going to take a considerable amount of time to move totally to, to a different renewable or different energy to, for transport, um, with EV being probably the fundamental one that everyone, but you do have hydrogen fuel cell, you do have LPG. There are other forms of, of uh, energy from that point of view. So next slide. Okay, looking at the, the regulations and local low emission zones today. Many countries have adopted, okay, that they know that what they will do is what they want to do is, is ban the, the internal combustion engine at a period in time. But what we're now seeing is, is actual cities within those countries of accelerating this introducing low emission zone um, and I think if anyone knows London well enough 
Uh, there has been a congestion charge in London for many years. Uh, that has now extended to, you will see in diesels will be totally banned from, from London from 2025 and petrol engines, internal combustion engines from 2030. So it's, an, as we show, showed in the previous slide uh, that engineer Faisal showed, it was 2040 as the UK moved to ban internal combustion engines totally. So what you can see is that now countries are taking in high areas of population, which when we look back at a lot of the models that we had five, six years ago before COVID came, is that we saw that urban conurbation was going to grow. There will be more smart cities, the populations will increase. So the need was identified that we need to, to move people um, into those areas and they will expand and we will bring electric vehicles or, or other forms of transportation and energy use at that point in time. Interestingly, if you look at the UK today with, with home working, we're now seeing a totally different um, format appearing where people are trying to move out of, of these areas into the countryside because home working has become uh, so dependent, dependable and everyone realised that they can work from home a lot easier. So, but that doesn't stop the need for the EV. So that just gives you an idea really there on the main countries in Europe and what they are looking for on low emission zones. As you can see, Rome, Madrid, Paris have all adopted the same type of, of strategy on that area. So next slide. Uh, the next slide is more interesting from the point of view is that I don't know if everyone is aware of, of CAFE regulation, which is the corporate average fuel economy regulation mainly has been introduced by many governments uh, to reduce the fleet and passenger car and, and what we call light truck or LCV, uh, the total consumption of the fuel consumed within the country. At the same time, you reduce your carbon emissions and over a long period of time, what you are introducing is, is you are introducing a much cleaner environment and the country is not so reliant or burning the same amount of level of fuel that it would be as normal. What we tend to see is that, for the interest of everyone listening, is that Saudi Arabia introduced the cafe in 2016 and the programme should run to 2025 with the objective of reducing the, the fuel economy of the fleet of all manufacturers. The idea is, is that the manufacturer will adopt to market new technologies, um, which are much cleaner, much more fuel efficient uh, over that period of time. And that everyone works on a target fuel economy curve based on the size, the engine of the car, etc., to try to achieve the target year on year. Um, and there is a credit and deficit facility within that. As you can see, many countries have adopted throughout the world. And this is one way of driving electric vehicles. Um, because as you see that the target becomes much harder to achieve. Technologies are, are, are not are expensive in certain areas that we have to introduce as a manufacturer. Electric technology is starting to become now much more cheaper than some of the other technologies that we use for internal combustion engines. So CAFE programs, uh, which are designed to introduce new, new technologies um, for internal combustion engines, etc., will drive the adoption of, of electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles, because it's one way that we have to get the fuel economy down on that basis. OK, next slide. So really looking at the EV sales worldwide, um, we probably today as Renault in Europe are the largest or the, the most, we've sold the most electric vehicles over the past 10 years um, throughout Europe um, with our range. But what you can see is the adoption of electric vehicles, which is globally um, with China being 
the biggest market in the world and will be uh, based on population size and the technology that they've introduced to how electric vehicles are starting to be adopted globally on that basis. We see today, if we take from last year, um, we were at 1.6 million worldwide sales, which was 36% on 2018, the number of sales. So it equivalent to 1.8 of the, the total vehicle market throughout the world. In 2025, it will seem that there will be 11 million electric vehicles, the estimation is, which will be 10% of the global TIV. And as you can see from 2030, it will be 25%. So everyone is looking at electric vehicles. It is a slow adoption because you have to take into consideration to build infrastructures is not something that you do overnight. It takes a lot of planning, smart cities, etc. And it's the other technologies that we can bring with that to take the adoption. And I think we have to look very clearly at, at EV from, from our point of view is that still today, awareness and education is probably the number one subject that we need to focus on with the normal retail consumer, because there is still a lot of anxiety to an electric vehicle. A petrol vehicle or a diesel vehicle is very easy. You go to the gas station, you fill up, you drive away. People still don't like to think of change and adopting the change is probably the, the biggest um, step that you're going to take if you buy an electric vehicle. Once taking it, it's a different situation. Um, but we always look at it, it is a mobility solution today. Um, because sometimes the need doesn't fit. If you live in an apartment building, it's not so easy to charge. We understand that. But the more and more public charging, the more it becomes easier. And with, with what we see with car sharing, people will adopt to on that basis. So that gives you really what the, the estimation for the EV market is looked at over the next 10 years. So by the 2030, our, the estimates are is that there will be 30 million electric vehicles in operation on that basis. Next slide. Uh, this gives you the, the continuous growth in Europe. Obviously, as a European manufacturer, our main market for electric vehicle today, and with WLTP, which is uh, the emission uh, standards that were introduced, uh, for the whole of Europe, we see battery electric vehicle are increasing. And even in this year of COVID, where as manufacturers, our capacity to manufacture at the same level we were doing a year ago has changed because obviously we have to be safe, we have to put standards in. So it reduces the number of vehicles that we can actually produce. We see that the market still is up 46% year to date on August, and that is the total market for Europe. And we see at the moment, it represents 4% of the TIV, uh, of the total uh, TIV battery electric vehicles in Europe. So it's growing, but it's growing slowly. With the regulations that I said spoke previously, we expect that as we see will grow and grow and grow. And there's incentives and various different other things to, to introduce more and make it more adopted in each of the countries. Okay, um, and for my final slide, which is next, please. Uh, final two. Uh, with EV, I think what people don't realize today, and I, the, probably this is the better the slide, is that it is an ecosystem. There is more to an electric vehicle than just a vehicle, a car. Uh, there are various different things. And if we look at a project that we took back, started in 2008, or we participated in 2008 with the World Wildlife Fund um, in Porto Santo, which is a small island north of the Canaries, off, off of Portugal, uh, they have a total ecosystem. So there, there are no, no, um, there are no uh, internal combustion engines on the, on the island. It's a very small island. 
It's 11 kilometers long and six kilometers wide. But the ecosystem is, is that they've gone from 15% or they will do to 99.5% renewable energy by 2030. Um, and the park have, have gone from 1% to 100% EV. And you can see we've built a, a electric storage capacity. And in t as well as that, we're looking at vehicle to grid. So vehicle to grid is that you plug your vehicle in and you use the energy from your vehicle and give it back into your grid, into your home. So an electric vehicle now is not just you are going to drive. You can use the energy at peak uh, times, reduce the demand on the grid and supply your uh, residents with sufficient amount of energy at that period in time. So we see the carbon footprint will, will reduce um, in this, but this is a project that started. It's become very successful and worldwide known. It's the first smart island, but it just gives you an idea is that there is a lot more to an electric vehicle than just a vehicle. And the future holds a lot more as we as we move forward as we see battery technology will improve various different other things and that and connected cars okay so thank you very much that's uh, the conclusion of my presentation And that too, from an international uh, markets point of view and other aspects. Thanks a lot. Moving on, I'm uh, happy to introduce you to our next speaker, Mr. Rabi, Rami Abu Haya. He's a chief executive officer of Catec Mobility. As a CEO of Cubic Art Technologies, a customer centric and technology driven company, Rami is responsible for running all aspects of the business. He has proven executive management track record and over the years of experience driving sales growth in particularly in the technology industry. Prior to joining his current role, he was the managing partner at the Cubic as, and as the manager, managing partner of Cubic Arts Pixels, responsible for strategic waste management solutions, chief executive officer at Catech Mobility, the electro mobility division of Catex, which provides future proof, future proof EV charging solutions. He has established companies relating to IT, consultancy services, financial and management consulting services in Amman, Jordan, Abu Dhabi, and overall in the UAE as an executive partner. Rami, looking forward to the perspectives from the technology and the charging industry in particular. Over to you. Thanks, Faisal, for the introduction, and hello to everyone out there. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm uh, Rami Abu Hayye. As I mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm the CEO of Catech Mobility. I'd like to thank the CEP the CEPC and Enoch as well for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about EV charging for petrol stations in specific. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just a quick overview uh, on Catech. Uh, Catech founded in 2005 in UAE. We've been at uh, e-mobility business for two years now. Uh, we've got a bit more than 50 clients and over 120 EV charging projects in the region, namely UAE, Jordan, and Kuwait. In 2018, uh, Ketik Mobility has partnered up with EVBox, which is uh, really an innovative solution provider and one of the world's largest EV charging manufacturers offering innovative, intelligent, and future-proof software and AC and DC fast charging products. Uh, EV, EV Box ha, has been in business for uh, about 10 years and uh, throughout the 10 years they've installed over 150,000 charging points worldwide. They've installed, uh, they have an installation and maintenance ongoing in over uh, 70 countries around the world. And also financially they have backed up, backed by NG, which is one of the largest energy uh, service companies in the world at around $70 million a year in revenue. Catech Mobility also has approved Tesla Charger uh, installer throughout UAE to the commercial, industrial, and domestic sector. Next, please. 
Well, currently in UAE, we are seeing an exponential growth in this industry, clearly led by, by Tesla, while the other automakers are really invested heavily in this space. And next year, we will see a big official push for electrified cars. So expected to witness a stream of new PEVs uh, going on sale in the region, including the Audi e-tron, Porsche Taycan, Mercedes EQC, as well as uh, more offering from Tesla. This is in addition to the Jaguar i uh, along with the Chevrolet Bolt, MJ, ZS, and uh, Renault Zio, uh, that are already on sale. In, in terms of numbers, in UAE so far, there are over 3,000 EVs, around 10 models and more than 600 charging points, mainly uh, found in major cities and the customer behavior very much depend on private charge points for short distance travel rather than a public charging network. A very large number of players are entering and preparing themselves to drive the transformation towards real e-mobility at the large scale. Several global automakers are now taking a lead in the development of a few infrastructure for AV. Next, please. <coughs> so the, the, the world of e-mobility is shifting into high gear and now is the time for petrol stations to prepare for the ride. Although still in its infancy, the adoption of electric vehicles is expected to mature, uh, mature rapidly over the next 15 years, as, as uh, shown uh, in the, the presentation of Mr. Faisal and uh, Mark. Uh, by 2030, we, are, we predict nearly 10% of all new cars sold will be electric. Today, uh, 50 kilowatt charger are the most common type of public fast charger and, ta uh, and take about 30 minutes to fully charge a vehicle. The technology exists to, chain, to charge in 5 to 10 minutes. Uh, however, there are very few cars that are compatible with those more powerful chargers. EV are no longer a passing futuristic trend. They are a reality that all businesses should be considering as the demand, as the demand for EV raise. We believe that e-mobility uh, e shouldn't be viewed as a threat to petrol stations. It should be viewed as an, an additional revenue stream that has a strong potential for generating space and in-store traffic. This is a real market with a real demand that must be met. One of the greatest limitation with EV use today is long distance travel. Petrol stations are the key to solving that issue by adding EV chargers to their operations. According to many market researchers, more drivers will start switching to electric vehicles when they know they can easily find an EV charger at least every 120 kilometer of driving. Next, please. Well, charging infrastructure, much like electric vehicles, are experiencing a, a growth state in supply and av available technology. There are some four main segments often referred to when rega with regards to uh, e-mobility charging infrastructure. As you can see by the slide, charge, charging can either be done at public or private charging points. Public charging points are operated by a CPO or charging point operator, whereas the private segment contains all charging ca carried out typically either at home or, or at work. The figure shows the four different uh, identified segments where long distance public charging is marked by an icon of a vehicle seeing as it is the most relevant segment in the future. Comprehensive and user-friendly public charging network is one of the main long-term driver behind growth of the EV market. While there is a clear growth and overall important of a charging infrastructure, 
there are still doubts in the future of charging infrastructure. The current trend is, toward, is towards fast charging in early markets in order to cover uh, geographics and concerning uh, and connecting uh, regions with sufficient local charging options. Next. There is always risk in being an early adapter. Uh, but luckily for e-mobility, the written on the wall is clear. This technology is coming and businesses should prepare. Businesses that start building out their EV plans early also get the benefit of experimenting with different business models to find the right way to best serve their customers. There are dozens of examples of Co uh, companies such as uh, Nokia and Kodak that failed because they ignored innovation until the world moved on without them. There are three reasons for petrol stations, including Enoch, to step into the uh, electric vehicle charging business. Number one, possibility to test different EV charging business models uh, effortlessly. For example, charging service, uh, charging service models can vary from free to time-based, uh, kilowatt hour-based, or a pricing based on campaigns depend on your needs and local regulations. Uh, number two, learn and make decisions based on tested evidence. So you can gain knowledge on how electric car drivers behave in UAE and change business variables easily based on tried and true facts. Uh, number three, start running an EV charging service with low risks and enter the market today with enab enables petrol station businesses to put its EV charging uh, pilot to commercial use quickly. Next. <clears throat> this slide featuring multinational oil giants like Shell, Total, and BP are starting. Uh, are starting to make huge investments in the business of EV charging infrastructure by acquiring startups. Other brands have joined efforts with other EV charging players and start installing public EV chargers at their petrol stations. These are just a few samples of how oil and gas companies face the challenge of meeting the world's de demand for more energy while attempt to deliver it with few or fewer uh, emissions. This consolidations effort started in 2016 and is expected to keep happening till 2021 or so. Next. Catech Mobility is here to help you along the way of entering the EV market and ad advance towards the energy uh, transitions. Our uh, charging solutions are powered by durable components and intelligent software. Our charging stations are compatible with every electric vehicle now and in the future. Uh, using our EV charging management uh, platform, Shabik, uh, will help you to build your own EV charging infrastructure Necessary features to help you accelerate in the EV business include roaming, billing, and smart charging, all of which our Shabik software can offer you. We offer both managed and fully outsourced packages or of, uh, of our EV charging hardware as well as a Shabik EV charging software. Next, please. This slide shows our EV our EV charging hardware portfolio. We have both AC or level two, we call it level two, as well as DC or level three products ranging from 7.2 kilowatt to 350 kilowatts. Also identify the industry segments that best align with the charging solution. For example, AC chargers are great for workplaces, hospitality, apartments, or anywhere that you could do some overnight charging. While DC or direct chargers can charge multi -EV, uh, multiple EV day, daily, making it perfect for petro petrol stations and public parking lots. The minutes that you see, huh, see how the approximate time to, to, to charge 60 uh, kilowatt hour, uh, go back please, <coughs> still. 
So uh, to charge 60, 60 kilowatt hour vehicle to get 290 uh, kilo, kilometer of range. So we we wanted to kind of show show you some idea of what like the time we are often uh, asked that how long does it take to fill up a car, a car battery. So you can see the AC products, it is about uh, seven hours where the DC products are much faster. 100 kilowatt is about 30 and uh, and then our 360 kilowatt is less than 10 minutes next e-mobility is here to stay it's not going anywhere petrol stations are in the best position to meet the ev charging demand however if if those businesses were to act rest assured another type of site a site host will step in and fill the void Every business must follow their own path to get into the EV charging space, but there is still one common thread, act now or get left behind. Next. Once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and there is uh, our contact information. Do you have any questions that you might have on adapting EV charging in your operation? Please contact us today. Thank you very much. Hello. You are on mute. Puzzle, we, we can't, can't hear you, I think. I think. Yeah. Sorry, gentlemen. Sorry, gentlemen. Rami, thanks yeah, for thanks your session. For your and thanks to all the three panelists, panelists for wonderful, wonderful presentations. Presentation. Now, the floor is open to all the attendees to, uh, to ask a few questions. So please feel free to use uh, the system on your right hand side and pose the questions we'll be happy to take over the questions and uh, have the panelists answer them now uh, to start with i think faisal one question uh, maybe i can start with you uh, you you mentioned about the various economics or the decision making with respect to the comparison of the cost between the ev and the traditional vehicles uh, which is a major decision factor when you make the strategies. So consider, considering that, how do you see the strategy evolving on the horizon of say 2025 or 2030? What, what, what can we expect with respect to the green mobility strategy for Dubai? Uh, Sorry, sorry, Faisal, I think you are on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Faisal, you are unmuted now. Yeah, okay. It was from your side, I think. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, I think in my uh, presentation, that uh, if we go back uh, 10 years back, uh, uh, we have looked at the evolution of uh, EV and also hybrid in terms of price. Uh, uh, we can see that uh, there is a, a change in price, especially the technology and advance, advancement in battery uh, manufacturing. I think this is the key thing. 
and uh, uh, it can go faster in terms of cost parity, in terms of uh, tipping point, uh, could be five years away, could be a bit more than this. Uh, but uh, for us, I think uh, we do have to prepare uh, the ground uh, to move, uh, as I said, slow, slowly toward uh, our objective, which basically increasing the penetration. I mean, if you look at the numbers that we have, uh, it's not high, but uh, I think the key is uh, moving forward. The key is basically doubling uh, uh, the number, the key is uh, tripling maybe the number but that we have in mind. I think this is uh, the key thing in order not to disturb uh, uh, the economy. I think uh, we want to see ourselves uh, five years away from today that we have reached uh, 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 in terms of uh, total numbers of uh, vehicles, in terms of available uh, model, which is basically responsibility of the uh, car manufacturer. Also in terms of uh, uh, number of charging point in Dubai, we want to see it increase, of course, that basically uh, tally with the uh, number of available, uh, uh, especially I think now beside uh, Tesla, I think uh, uh, typically uh, we don't have, especially in EV, the typical uh, desired vehicle are not available uh, in, in the market, you know, if you look at the uh, uh, the normal sedan size uh, that basically uh, attractive in the UAE. Uh, you, it's not uh, basically many except the uh, Model 3 from Tesla. I think uh, that's a, that's uh, one barrier which uh, should come in uh, one or two years and then uh, helps uh, the market develop further. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. I think uh, one generic question, if I may ask to all the panelists, maybe I can start with Mark, is how can we advance green mobility further in Dubai? What do you think, are, say, if you can summarize in three points, Mark? Mark, sorry, let me, let me try to unmute you. Yeah, okay. Uh, three points. Uh, very, very simple for me. Infrastructure. Um, awareness is the most uh, important thing. Infrastructure and awareness. Infrastructure today, uh, my own personal opinion, will, over the next two years, unless it grows, it will start to become a problem. Um, because there are more models coming to market. We see a lot of different things, um, I would say, on infrastructure as well, from the point of view is that people tend to think sometimes that the charging space is a parking space, not a charging space. So frequently you will see uh, Tesla's parked in charging spaces, but they're not using it. They're parking it because it's close to the door. Um, now, someone that's got an electric car who sees that, it becomes an inconvenience if you can't charge. This is what then switches people away from, from purchasing electric vehicles. It, it's the inconvenience. So we need to, to obviously have, have some etiquette amongst EV owners. Um, but as I said, infrastructure, the infrastructure will need to develop because the more cars there are, the more we need to develop. Um, education. That's the other thing. And the other point we really do need to look at is, is that OEMs, what we see today, a lot of the vehicles are at a, a, a higher price level. If you want to accelerate the adoption, uh, we need to bring vehicles or we need to see more vehicles competition at a lower price because Today, a lot of people won't buy a, an EV because it's out of their purchasing. If you take, if you look probably at the population and look at purchase power, uh, at the moment, people are buying Teslas and there are more high earning areas. So your, your TIV will be lower. But if you want to accelerate, you are going to have to bring, obviously, a lot more uh, smaller vehicles, which are more af uh, affordable price. And that's probably today, as manufacturers struggle with, is, is that manufacturers have to be pro profitable 
Um, so we all have to look at that area. And I think we have to all work together to try and accelerate that with all, all stakeholders on that point. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, Rami, any any points for you to add uh, apart from the points which Mark mentioned on how to further drive EV in the region? If organizer, if you can unmute Rami. Yes, uh, yeah, I believe Mark covered <laughs> most of the points, but uh, I will emphasize more on the infrastructure issue. Uh, especially, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the long, the long uh, distance public ch uh, chargers are the main barrier for adopting uh, more EV in the region. Because from personal experience and from professional experience, the main, the main point or the main issue uh, to 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 move to EV is uh, the limit of the distance that you you are will be able to drive. For example, if you wanna if you wanna travel to Ras Al Khaimah or to Abu Dhabi or Al Ain or you want to drive to Abu Dhabi and then to Al Ain, there will be an issue. You will, you won't be use uh, your EV, even if you have the, the biggest one or 100 kilowatt hour battery, because there is not enough or sufficient uh, EV infrastructure on the road, uh, on the way. And uh, except uh, uh, last exit, for example, they got four superchargers, but on one way, not on the other way. So. Uh, there is um, many challenges, and uh, nowadays uh, most of the uh, taxis, EV taxis, are using the public uh, charger and keeping it busy most of the time. So if you are traveling between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and you need to 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 top up your car with a uh, hundred kilowatt, which is around 10, uh, 10, hour, 10, uh, 10 minutes, you are going to face uh, a challenge because you need to to wait a, a long of t uh, a lot of time until the taxis or the public transportation uh, so the the for the public transportation they have to consider other options or maybe provide uh, infrastructure uh, within their facilities or uh, because this is the only now they they are using the public uh, the public chargers as the only source of uh, charging and the second point, I believe the government incentives is very important. Uh, one of the government incentives that uh, we saw in UK, for example, the government are subsidizing the, the cost of uh, installing EV charges, uh, especially for the individuals. So uh, if you if you planning to buy a, uh, an EV, the government will pay, uh, pay the cost, uh, or I think uh, part of it, uh, to, to get your charger ready and installed in your facility or at your home. And third, uh, encouraging or uh, incentivize uh, fleet operators to move into EV. This is very important because, uh, you know, the transportation, as mentioned by Mr. Faisal, it's the, the, the main reason for the pollution. And uh, we know in, in UAE, there is uh, a lot of uh, transportation fleets on the road, so uh, we don't see uh, a huge, like, or a uh, big uh, shifting from ICE to EV in this uh, space. That, thank you, thank you, Rami. I think if I, if I summarize the points from Mark and Rami, I think one point is definitely on the infrastructure. That that's an area which can be further improved, and it's an area which needs to be improved anyways on, on an ongoing basis. Second is a point mentioned ever mentioned around awareness and uh, Rami also further expanded on on those points. Faisal, any any particular points you want to add in particular? I think maybe I think there was a mention about incentives and uh, there are already incentives in place in Dubai, but you want to further add to any of these points in terms of how we can drive the green mobility further in Dubai? Yeah, I think uh... The point that uh, Mr. Rami mentioned is uh, is valid. Uh, you just have to. Uh, we already have a public charging point, which uh, basically already there is an incentive. You know, it's uh, free of charge. I think for uh, the private uh, charging point, I, I think uh, uh, 
there are many, I think, parties are involved in this. Uh, in order to get into these type of things, I think you have to look at the whole thing. Um, uh, I know the number is very small, uh, but uh, uh, as we, I think, uh, when we deal with uh, the economy itself, when we look at the DSM as a whole, and we look at the big project that cost us, uh, let's say, um, uh, billion uh, 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 capital investment in order to basically do retrofit, in order to basically upgrade our uh, lighting. I think uh, if we don't connect to the uh, cost of the power generation, we don't connect to the cost of the uh, upstream generation, I don't think uh, we'll be able to see uh, the benefit. Uh, that's why when we look at uh, any cost, we'll have to look at the payback period, we'll have to look, to, uh, to look at the total uh, cost of ownership for government uh, as a whole, if we look at the supply and the demand side management. And we're doing this, but I don't think we can do it uh, uh, at large scale uh, as we speak today. But slowly, we're, we're basically involving a key decision maker, especially in non-energy, I think, decision maker. People will look at the economy, to look at the uh, basically the growth. Um, I think uh, they also need to be part of the decision making when it comes to, uh, I think, sustainability uh, projects. So this is a small part of it, which you have mentioned, but uh, uh, I think the, the COVID-19 came on the way also. Uh, so it, may, it, will, it might uh, basically uh, delay some of the initiatives, some of the future incentive that uh, can be considered. But we are very hopeful that uh, uh, things will change in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, we have started receiving the questions from the audience. Uh, Mark, I think the next one is perhaps something which you can take. So the question is, uh, there have been discussions on the savings so far about the fuel prices versus electricity. But what about the sale cost and ease of regular vehicle maintenance versus EV? How does that turn out for a customer perspective? Uh, organizer, if you can unmute Mark and all the panelists, I think that will be helpful. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Uh, uh, if you look at total cost of ownership, um, obviously on an EV, you're looking at probably around about 60 to 70 percent of your total cost of ownership over your maintenance period uh, if you take an EV. Uh, there, there is no oil change. It's basically a vehicle check and a change of AC pollen filter. So your your total cost, plus the fact is that I think if you look and what we've done is we were finding that we were looking at around about a full charge was costing us 28 dirhams to do in effect 250 to 300 kilometers. So the cost of your ownership again in relation to fuel price reduces again. So that's where you tend to find is that you will see a lifetime saving. Over 100K we work on 100,000 uh, kilometers. It's around about 60% of your current against an ICE is the total cost of ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Rami, an interesting question for you. Uh, for a customer, what is the difference in terms of AC versus DC charging? Uh, how do you compare the pros and cons of each method? What's the difference between AC and DC, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the AC uh, is mainly, uh, we call it the regular or slow charging method, uh, which is uh, maximum up to 22 kilowatt hour starting from 7.2 up to 22 kilo hours and this is uh, uh, either single phase or three phase uh, but the dc is a direct current which is uh, uh, a fast charging fast charging uh, type of chargers which uh, mainly used for destinations as well as the highway and public uh, charging which uh, uh, has the capac capability to charge the, the the vehicle faster than the AC. Uh, 
usually at home and work spaces, we go for ACs or AC chargers. And uh, some of the DCs, because of the nature of the, of the device itself, some of the DCs, uh, they have trans, uh, transformation inside, the, inside of it. So it has a different, different kind of setup and it cannot be uh, installed in, in, uh, for a private use only public use and, uh, and it has it has a special requirements to be installed from the government you have to get a special permit uh, pros and cons uh, the ac is always better for the for the batteries charging the car using ac a charger is always uh, is better but using a dc it's not recommended all the time it's only recommended for uh, for topping topping up the the uh, the car with uh, with some uh, kilo kilometer for for driving more, so uh, for daily use I think uh, AC is recommended for uh, trip or uh, travel uh, travel charging between between regions AC and maybe the, uh, at the destinations because DC 50 kilowatt is becoming a destination charger. There's no more uh, highway and high, but it's coming a DC charger. So this is the, the, the main difference between AC and DC. One point flies along that is an uh, interesting point is that people should realize is, is that what the car determines how you can charge. It's the charger with inside the car, not the charging station. So if the car has a facility of a 22 kilowatt charger inside it, it can charge at 22 kilowatts. If the station says it's 43 kilowatt charger, you still cannot charge at 43. You will only charge at 22 because the car's capability is at 22. Uh, and a lot of manufacturers work to 22. Um, and as Rami quite rightly says is, DC charging is not advised to be continually uh, carried out. You will reduce the lifespan of the battery if you do, because you are putting 50 volts DC directly into the battery, and with electricity, you create heat. So that's one of the reasons why is that we say that's more of a destination charger and should be used under those circumstances. But for normal charging, and if you manage your car correctly, uh, up to 22 is perfectly fine. And that's what you tend to find is the majority of, of charges are today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rami. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I think quite a few interesting questions got lined up, uh, but if I move to the next one, uh, Mark, I think this is something which you could answer based on your international experience. Uh, what are the best lessons learned or good? partnership models which we can adopt in terms of partnerships between the EV manufacturer and the service stations to promote more charging stations. Is there, is there any such partnerships across any parts of the globe in terms of promoting the service stations? Uh, I, I think if you look at, uh, the, if you take the UK, uh, people do destination charging in the UK because obviously the market's evolved slightly more than, than because we've been in EV for a while. But you tend to find is that there are a lot of charges on motorways, which would be the equivalent of the E61, the 11, etc. Um, but with those uh, those those places, we tend to find there is an area where the driver can take a break, sit down. Obviously, he's got another area that he knows he's planned his journey. He's going to spend 30 minutes. He's going to stop there. He's going to charge. He's going to go in and use the facility and, most importantly, spend money. So that, that's the objective from that point of view. So from, from really, if we look at it from the fuel station business, the model obviously has to evolve. It has to allow more, with more charging stations, there need to be more areas um, that will give the facility for the driver to do other things at that point in time. So that's where you've seen the partnerships where a lot of areas in the UK on motorway stations is, they make in certain areas the charging free, similar to what we're doing here, but they do it to attract people because they know people will go there to charge and at the same time, they will spend money 90% of the time. 
So that's really the partnership. And I think with EV and with various different other things with connected services today, there's lots of opportunity for partnerships in d different areas um, completely about the whole ecosystem. But that's where I would say your partnership is, is where you have to be. I would like to add uh, to Mark, uh, uh, from our experience here in the region, uh, for example, in Jordan, as a EV, EV charging suppliers, uh, we partnered with uh, one of the national petrol uh, stations to roll out 200 DC charger over, over five years. Uh, the engagement was uh, a partnership uh, based on revenue sharing. So our part is to, to, to invest in the, in, the, in the CapEx or the hardware and uh, to operate the network for 15 years. Uh, and the other model or engagement model or partnership model is to provide uh, the char chargers as a service, not as a hardware, as a service. We have a model that we can provide uh, the mobility service provider like petrol stations or uh, uh, providing them with the service, not the hardware. So we provide the hardware, we maintain, we operate the hardware for a certain number of years without uh, without any hassle and without uh, uh, worry about the technology changing the technology and the uh, operate uh, operating know-how so and the the third one which is the traditional partnership is the traditional procurement uh, uh, supply the hardware and the services based on the client requirements thank you thank you i think uh Quite a lot of questions. I think it's it's coming from a lot of uh, audience. I think it's basically querying the impact of the green mobility on the oil and gas demand uh, because energy sector is a key sector in the region. I, I think before I leave to panels, uh, the panelists actually to give the view on the demand of uh, green mobility on the oil and gas sector. And particularly, maybe if there is any such numbers in the UAE, I think one one point I would like to add this this is a question which does not have a straightforward answer, because uh, as you know, the demand and the forecasting is a very tough uh, thing to do, especially in the current times. Uh, we know there are lots of studies by IEA, the World Oil, even the IOCs, the, like the likes of the BP and the Shell. You can see in the public domain they have lots of energy transition reports. Uh, in in my understanding, uh, there have been figures of four to eight uh, million barrels per day impact uh, because of EVs uh, by 2030 to 2040, but we still do not have a definite answer for that. And the main reason is because it depends on a lot of uncertainties. I mean, it depends on the market. It depends on the market share of IOCs versus NOCs. And I think the recent COVID situation has completely changed the dynamics and the demands. But I leave it to the panelists. If you have a view on uh, number one, the, de the impact on the oil and gas sector, how do you think is the demand is going to change? Uh, are there any sp specific numbers for the region or uh, any numbers which you have in your mind? Faisal, maybe I can start with you. Yeah, basically, I think uh, the way we look at this, uh, we look at the uh, the bigger picture, which is the energy as a whole, not only the, uh, the mobility aspect. Uh, we uh, I think in, in the past, uh, like 10 years back, uh, the share of uh, supply power generation in Dubai uh, used to be 99% uh, natural gas. And then uh, we, we have, uh, we didn't have renewable at, at that uh, time. Uh, and as we speak today, the renewable is more than 10%. And by, uh, there are many big projects also are uh, under construction. So we are very much on target to reach 25% uh, share of renewable by 2030. I think the key aspect when it comes to supply and demand, uh, we uh, monitor, uh, I think, uh, the, the landscape of the whole energy in terms of price, in terms of advancement. Uh, our uh, basic strategy used to be 5% renewable by 2030, just uh, five years back or, or six years back. And then we have reviewed uh, the strategy. <clears throat> uh, we have upgraded to 25%. And uh, we always monitor uh, the, the basically what's happening uh, elsewhere. And based on that, we take a decision. 
and every three to four years we update our strategy and we look at these uh, things. So with the, with the green mobility also the same thing, uh, it goes into, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to have, we already have a, a fossil fuel uh, based infrastructure today, a huge fossil fuel as you uh, look at it in terms of uh, share. And uh, as long as you go slowly toward, you know, the evolution, I, I don't think uh, uh, the economy will be uh, affected. Uh, and this is what we are we're at today, that to have a, a gradual evolution so we don't disturb our economy. Uh, and uh, the supply and demand, as I said, it is not going to be a drastic change, you know, from in one year we just jump into uh, something that we need to take a drastic decision. It's going to be very slow and gradual and it gives us time to take decision and to make amendment. Thanks. Thanks, Faisal. Uh, Mark, your views on the impact of the growth of the sector on the other sectors, uh, in particular the oil and gas sector? Uh, I mean, personally, I don't think that it's going to have a major, major impact on the oil and gas sector. Um, over over the next 10 years, I see, if you go back to my slide where I showed is that the TIV is expected to be by 2030 globally at 25 percent. Um, I can remember going back to 2010, people saying that 10 percent of the, the world be using electric vehicles by 2020, uh, which it never achieved. We're going to move a lot quicker. But they'll still be reliant on oil and gas. Whatever way we look, the world is not at the point of everyone has nuclear technology to provide electricity. We still will have to evolve. Um, a lot of other countries which are much further behind will still have a reliant on oil and gas. So I think it will be a gradual adoption. And, it, and as quite rightly said before, it has to fit in with the, with the economies. Um, we can't just jump from one thing to another because there will be a major effect on the economy as, uh, economies as we see it. So it's going to be a, tradual, a gradual transition, but I think now governments understand that more and have planned the transition, are planning the transition, so that it will be really streamlined in that area. So I don't think it's going to have a major, major effect that everyone tomorrow is going to drive an electric car. Um, we've seen how far it's taken to adoption. We still have a lot of the old problems, anxieties today and education. It will take time. The only thing I would say is that the younger generation are less reliant on their own transport or use more of public type transport and are more, let's say, green than the older generations are. So I think the transition in that area will, will change. But again, the habits of people is, is that people where families own three or four cars um, is starting to see is that when people move into smart cities, or that was the plan, is that their ownership of cars would reduce. So I don't think we'll see a major, major impact at this moment in time, or not up till 2030 at all. I think in, in that period, and I think it will take some time. Yeah, I think I think I think to add the benefits the oil and gas as players have in this region is the low cost of production, so that helps in the business model of the region. And I think one more good factor from an environment point of view, the greenhouse gas intensity per barrel of production in the region is very low. So even in that scenario, it it looks like the region will be like the last man standing, uh, which should help the business model. R R Rami, uh, one question, particular to the COVID-19 situation. Uh, how do you think the COVID-19 impacted uh, the EV penetration? Uh, do you see any such impact on the customers from a COVID-19 point of view, specifically on the EV market? Uh, definitely, the the COVID-19 impacted all industries and all businesses. This is uh, true, but uh, the EV market and the the mobility market in general one of the best actually it's uh, they are, it's performing very we we have different businesses here in uae different line of businesses one of the best businesses nowadays is uh, the mobility the uh, business 
So there is demand, and still it's it's moving, it's moving on. Even the the numbers which was uh, I think uh, by uh, Mark, it's showing uh, increase in the in the industry up four uh, percent. So it's still growing. Okay, not uh, uh, not like what was expected, but it's still growing. Okay, uh, Faisal, the next one is for you. Uh, what do you see the role of Supreme Council in en enhancing and upgrading the fossil fuel standards and engine specifications to meet the 2030 targets? Yeah, the uh, engine uh, specification and also fuel standards is basically uh, handled by the federal government. Uh, specifically by MR standardization and conformity department. We uh, are basically uh, key stakeholders, you know, all the all the Emirates, uh, whether it is ADNOC, ENOC, they are part of uh, the, the, I think, uh, the uh, contributor, contribution factors, uh, but it, led, it is led by the federal government. And we know that uh, every, uh, I think there is a committee already within this you know, in order to upgrade the fuel specification and engine specification. I think uh, we have mentioned or somebody mentioned the uh, CAFU uh, uh, standards uh, adopted by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I think that is one aspect which is also handled by the federal government. And uh, as we speak today, there is already an energy star rating uh, on, on vehicles in the UAE. So that is also helps the uh, uh, the buyer basically to decide to understand the uh, the gallon uh, the per, per mile or vice versa before purchasing a car. So we we have uh, star rating uh, for vehicle like we do for uh, household appli appliances today. Um, this is important as I said because of uh, air quality. So uh, EV and hybrid will be very slow as mentioned by Mark and by Rami. Uh, it will take time uh, as long as we are basically uh, uh, monitoring the situation will be fine. But in the meantime, we know that uh, uh, especially diesel, uh, not gasoline, diesel is basically uh, very aggressive when it comes to air quality. We want to ensure that we have uh, addressed, we, I mean, we're addressing the uh, NOx uh, uh, basically, uh, emission. We are addressing the CO2 and SO2, and of course the part, uh, the 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 solid uh, particles, which is uh, PM10 and PM2.5. Uh, I think these are the key uh, aspect when it comes to fuel uh, standards, and we also uh, look forward to improving on that. Uh, something has, is being handled by the federal government. Thanks, thanks, Faisal. Uh, Mark, I think, I think the next question is in relation to the oil and gas business model. Uh, do you see more and more uh, companies uh, focusing much more on the downstream side of the business, say, such as the lubricants, uh, automotive maintenance, usage of the retail station? Do you think the oil and gas players could come into services in the future? Um, it's an interesting question. What, uh, more so on on the EV area, because obviously there is a there's a business model there. Uh, what one of the things, as if you remember, I mentioned earlier, the total cost of ownership reduces dramatically with an electric vehicle. So yes, you could, um, but you would still see. Um, I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't service an EV. Um, the battery is, is a specific area, but to do a normal maintenance check of change filters, top level or top levels up, which is only windscreen washers, coolant you need, uh, an AC check is, no, is, is something that they can do. So it's not totally lost that area of the business. Um, what you would lose is, is the change of the engine oil from that. So you just redesign and redevelop your 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 program, um, but you could still compete in that market. There's no real re real reason not to. And 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 how do you see uh, more and more people using the retail stations while they are charging at the charging stations? 
is that a business model which can be also tapped into? That, that, that is that is something to consider because if you can offer a, a, a service while someone's charging, um, that's an area that that you should that could be well considered because you will you, you the inconvenience is gone the inconvenience of having to take it for service drop it off pick it up or sit there and wait you've addressed both of that and if it's on the same site and you have restaurant or area where you can obviously sell your merchandise sell your food you've hit everything in one so it's another business model to look at mm -hmm. Good point. Actually, lots, lots, lots to think about from different angles. Actually, for lots of businesses, it, 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 uh, it's thinking of all the other angles. That's right. Uh, Rami, a question for you: What role could the startups, in particular, play for the development of the market? And what do you think are the major areas within the mobility industry where the startups can support? What are the major areas? Yeah, what are the major areas in, in the in the green mobility industry where startups can play a role and can make business? Okay, well, so uh, there is, uh, I believe, the, on the technology side, there is uh, many areas where the start can play can play a major role, especially when it's come to the management system of the of the charging infrastructure, for example. Uh, and the ecosystem, because uh, we all believe that uh, when the when the network uh, is growing, uh, the the customer experience is one of the main and key factor that should be considered. And uh, uh, I believe in the future, one once there will be a more player in the in the market. Like uh, now, we have Diwa Network. In the future, we are going to have another another network, for example, in Abu Dhabi and other Emirates. So uh, the technology is going to play a major role here by integrating those uh, networks to make the uh, the driver and the user uh, life much easier. So does, uh, they don't uh, really want to, to care which car they are going to use to charge their car, while they just uh, will be uh, uh, just considering the 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 the, the petrol station or charging uh, the charging point nearby to charge their car this is all so there is a lot of technology behind the behind the charging infrastructure uh, i believe the the startups can can play many 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 role in this uh, payment payment systems uh, roaming systems and uh, load balancing as well uh, there is many uh, many areas also to to for the startups to, to consider when it's come to the uh, efficiency of utilizing the the power uh, there is many components many technologies can be uh, invented to uh, optimize the, the consumption of the power and to make it more efficient uh, the vehicle to grid we don't have anything in the region here vehicle to grid is this the, the next uh, I think the next uh, stage uh, everyone should uh, should uh, consider always the startups uh, the operation as well uh, when it's come to the service size the operation of the infrastructure could be uh, an area for the for the startups using the technology using the uh, the digital transformation thank you thank you Rami lots of ideas there for the ones who are interested in uh, startups uh, uh, Mr. Faisal, I think uh, one question: how, how do you think we can plan to make uh, the green vehicles uh, like a mass market kind of a movement, and at the same time make sure the impact on the environment is less? I mean, what are the ingredients towards making making EVs towards a mass market movement? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, there are three. Uh, uh, component one component I think the upfront capital investment I think today as we speak today still cannot be uh, very attractive we know that uh, the cost parity or the tip tipping point is uh, some years away and we hope it is nearby uh, this is the first thing and then the second thing is the uh, uh, I would say the uh, available model uh, in the region 
especially I think uh, the sizes that we have today in the market, especially with EV, I think that is the key. So uh, to, to offer car owner more uh, option uh, to uh, purchase a vehicle. I think there's also a lack of uh, maybe attractive uh, uh, financial option uh, by the financial institute. I think this will be a key. Uh, and as uh, I think Rami mentioned in detail, the challenges with the, uh, I think, charging point, uh, different type of charging point. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, I think there are, I mean, uh, one uh, important part of the society, which is basically people who live in, in and uh, condos and live in a uh, building, I think they don't have option of basically there is no provision to charge, you know, in their building. So they, they, they depend on the public charging point and that's the limitation. So uh, I think that these are basically the, ma the main thing. And also Mark mentioned the, kind of the education part of the campaign. Many uh, car owners also, they need to uh, get to the point where uh, they understand the total uh, uh, ownership uh, code, which is getting more attractive and attractive to basically uh, to uh, own hybrid or EV uh, versus uh, ICE. Great, great, Faisal. Uh, Mark, what, what, one point which Faisal touched upon is is kind of the financial benefits uh, and. I mean, one word which uh, comes to any EV user, I mean, one thing which he always looks for is the incentives. I mean, there are a lot of incentives uh, already in place in Dubai, but what do you think would be the incentives which can be considered uh, so as to drive the market further, especially in the private sector, because as long as we don't get into the private sector, uh, we are not tapping the bigger share. So what can we think of from an incentive point of view to provide to the customers? Uh, incentives is difficult because the way the economy is based, it's very difficult where you see in, in some cases in Europe, there's a taxation system that enables you to give back um, to obviously from that point of view. It's different here. Yeah? So we have to consider that as well on that basis. The Probably the, the bigger cost of a vehicle is, is the cost of the battery. Now, if you look at European models, um a lot of uh, from from definitely from us here in the offset was is that we lease the battery so the reduction of the cost of the vehicle came comes down quite dramatically because you lease the battery out with a financial in institution um on that basis so the customer is basically playing like a mobile phone charge on a monthly basis over a period of time of five years that reduces the, the cost. It doesn't, it doesn't look so dramatic as what it is um, when you get put the, the final sticker price and it includes the cost of the battery. As technologies have advanced as well, the lithium ion cost per kilowatt is reduced. So it enables the cost of the vehicles to start to come down. So I think, I mean, incentives today, we have free charging. I understand that the, uh, and I think there was free parking and selected. You don't pay a registration charge. Um, it really looks at, I think it's a bigger discussion to decide what other incentives there are. You can have a bonus malice, as I, I've always said, is that you could introduce a higher registration cars for vehicles that have got a very, very high CO2 and give that back to vehicles that have got a lower CO2 as some form of incentive. Um, but it's not a straightforward point that you can just do like that. It needs to be looked into a number of different ways. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Rami, I think uh, you work a lot in the technology industry, and I think. Uh, one thing over the technology industry has a big role is in shaping or understanding the consumer choices. I mean, I mean, from, from your experience so far in terms of giving such solutions, uh, how do you think is consumer perception so far on the EV market? I mean, what, what do you think are they, their major concerns or what are the main things which drive from a consumer point of view? 
in terms of intake TVs? From a consumer point of view, okay. Technology. See, uh, actually, the, the 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 technology now is available to make the driver life e much easier. One of the now all the all the charging infrastructure is available on on the map, where you can check the status of the charger. You can book the charger uh, ahead of time before you go before you go and uh, uh, waste your time. Because as I mentioned, now most of the public or not the public on uh, the the highway or long distance charging now with nowadays are uh, fully uh, utilized and occupied by the transport uh, uh, public transportation ev fleet so one of the uh, one of the things that technology makes our life easier is to check the status of the charger before we ahead and face an issue because if you have a limited uh, range to to drive and uh, the 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 other things now <clears throat> Uh, as, as as a fuel, as the uh, in the fuel industry, now the fuel we used to go to the petrol station to to fuel up our our car. Now the the fuel is coming to our doorsteps. To us. So the technology also can provide uh, uh, such technology for the charging. So uh, there is mobile chargers that can come uh, to your doorstep and charge your car. Uh, without the need to go and wait uh, long hours at at uh, at any any places, so uh, plus the technology, I believe the the disruptive technology and the digital transformation will create more business opportunities for especially for the petrol station, not only f uh, from the EV point of view, from 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 the la the the last mile uh, delivery issue. Now, uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, everyone is ordering online. So petrol station, they can use the technology or they can uh, joint efforts with uh, delivery companies to, pro to provide logistics using their facilities to be more closer to, to, to the end customer and to provide the, the service uh, faster than before, even to provide maybe a charging station or to be a charging hub for drones delivery which is coming in the future and uh, uh, we didn't cover the autonomous uh, cars the autonomous cars i believe it's coming uh, in the near future so uh, charging and providing service for the autonomous vehicles is something uh, very important and will create many business opportunity and will enhance the economy in the in the, in the near future Thank you. Thank you. That's a that's a good perspective, Rami. I think uh, the role of technology and making everything closer to the people is that something which all needs to plan well. Uh, good discussion so far, and we have five minutes uh, before we wind up the session. So I, I leave the floor to each of you to make your final remarks. Uh, Faisal, if I may start with you to have the closing remarks from your side. Yeah, I'll uh, just mention one one thing, which uh, basically I think is a key when we look at the uh, the whole landscape of a uh, uh, vehicle. Basically, there are more than one billion vehicles in the world, and the growth uh, annually is around 80 uh, million, approximately. I think this is where we come uh, from a green aspect perspective to basically penet penetrate into the, the, the 80 millions, uh, basically to ensure that the percentage will increase. Uh, and every year, uh, we, uh, based on the technology, I think we will move toward a cleaner future, we will move toward the uh, uh, clean energy transition uh, in the future. Uh, and also we realize that the, uh, the increase in, uh, number of uh, electric and green vehicles is uh, substantial but when it comes to i think the share is still negligible and there are many key questions that we cannot answer today uh, i think uh, the future will answer it for us uh, what will be the situation in 2030 uh, i think maybe we more or less we know what will be the picture in uh, two to three years but i think 10 years from today i think that that is a key thing there are many uh, R&D, I think, working on the battery development. That's the key. 
there are also not only AB, I think there is a, the hydrogen, the technology also is moving. Uh, it is slow, but it's, mo it's moving. I think this will also be a breakthrough uh, if something happens within the next five years. So I think these are uh, the key things that I want to mention uh, at the end of my talk. Great points, Faisal. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mark, over, over to your final thoughts on the topic. Uh, uh, final thoughts. I, I think no one has to be really majorly concerned that this is going to impact the the oil and gas industry overnight. I think this is a is a slow transitional process that will will take time, and in between that time, there will be a lot of technology changes. There are probably things will happen in the next five to ten years that today we won't even even thought of it as we sit here. Um, I think. EV adoption will really more take place when you have the, the opportunity that you go to a station, you plug in and you get a full battery within two to three minutes. So uh, if we could reach that point now, more people I think would go. We're a long way from that point as we stand today. So I, I think it, it's it's part of a transformation globally. And I think we all saw what COVID did when many countries went into lockdown earlier part of the year and the effect it had on the climate. Um, and I think if we look at it from that point of view, the less vehicles that are on the road or the more fuel efficient vehicles, I would say fuel efficient vehicles because fuel will still be available, will reduce our, our, from, from a climate point of view. EV is a mobility solution. I think everyone should understand that. Hybrid is a mobility solution. There are a number of different uh, mobility solutions, but I think today we can all see that governments are working towards a change um, and move into a greener mobility. And it's not something we can all say is gonna happen tomorrow. It's going to happen over a period of time. And I think what's been put in place today is starting to show and show the results are starting to show. Thank you, Mark. And uh, Rami, over to you for your final thought. Uh, well, I, uh, I think my final uh, note is every business has to get into uh, or to adapt uh, mobility and green mobility in their business, including charging EVs and uh, corporate car sharing or uh, carpooling and uh, uh, others. Uh, but also my recommendation is for the petrol station business is to think how to reach their customer, not to let them to come to their high. So there is many opportunity to provide services for their customer at their places, not only to wait them to 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 uh, to come uh, for uh, looking for the service, and uh, that's all we should act. And uh, the the future is coming, and uh, it's 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 soon it's soon than we we uh, we expect. Thank you, lovely discussion, everybody. Uh, once again, thanks to all the attendees. Uh, Enoch and Clean Energy Business Council to arrange uh, a 